so I'm uh, speaking in English, so uh, I will let uh, Jakub to introduce you our our guest, uh, so because you know. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce you uh, Robert J. Buxton, who is working on these and he's on several institutions, mainly Martin Luther's University in Halle, Wittenberg. And he's studying. Yeah, I invited him because of bees, and he's also doing like more than just bees, but uh, population biology in general. And uh, he's uh, combining several uh, several uh, methods and uh, making more uh, more interesting uh, research in, in the in the combination by these these methods. So I will let him uh, talk and you will, you will see. Okay, great. Thank you, Jakob. Thank you for the hospitality, the introduction now. Um, I've been having a great time here. It's been very enjoyable to listen to the defense of Katerina. Uh, yeah, there she is, yes, on Tuesday. So thank you very much. Now, um, I'm based in Halle in Germany, um, and I was going to talk about host parasite interactions and the decline of bees, or their role in the decline of bees. But after Katerina's talk, which had a lot of genetics in it, I thought, well, maybe I could expand and cover some elements of genetics and of host parasite interactions. And as Jakub already suggested, um, or indicated, I work on bees primarily um, for a variety of reasons, and I employ often genetic markers in that research. So it's more ecology, evolution, population biology, but with some strong um, influence of molecular genetics in that. So I'm hopefully going to say a few words today and hopefully convince you that genetics, we're not sure about the role host pathogen interactions certainly may play a role in helping us to understand why there may be ongoing declines of bees. First, a couple of words about me. Indeed, I'm at Halle, and that's about there on this, this image, this map. So not very far away from here. Yeah, I've got a pointer as well. And um, it's not big enough to p appear on that map, um, but there are some famous alumni of Halle and nearby. Uh, this person, Hendel, composer. Okay, maybe you prefer Smetana and so forth, but nonetheless, um, was a, was born in in Halle. And this person, Martin Luther, was born not far away in Eisleben and practiced at Wittenberg, and the university where I am is called the University of Martin Luther Universität Halle Wittenberg. So Wittenberg and Halle are combined together some way. This is Martin Luther, an effigy of Martin, a statue of Martin Luther uh, at Wittenberg. So anyway, on to bees. Why are bees important? I think we all know they're important as pollinators, really important as pollinators, honeybees and other bees. And why is there so much attention focused on bees and bee declines? Partly because in the USA in 2006, 2007, there was a big loss, apparently a big loss of honeybees, one species. So that created uh, a furore amongst um, journalists, but also amongst politicians, and it's led to considerable funding of research on bees and pollinators in general. I'm not sure whether in the Czech Republic the, the Science Authority, uh, the Science Research Council pays such attention, but certainly in the, in the USA, in the UK, where I used to be based until three years ago, and in Germany, those three governments put money into pollinator research, and quite a lot of money. And the reason why they do that is because pollination is important. It's suggested that maybe a third of what we eat is pollinator dependent. So this is a paper, if you probably, and if you're interested, you're aware of Galle, um, and the value of pollination is about 200 billion per year. Most of that pollination provided by insects, most by bees. And here's a nice image, which, uh, which I think comes from Claire Crayman. It's of a, a US whole food store called 
Whole Foods, and they decked out their shelves like normal on the left, and then they decked out their shelves on the right with foodstuffs, excluding any foodstuffs that were in insect pollinated, to show that if you didn't have insect pollinators, the diversity of foods that were, would be on offer to us would be much lower, and those that are there would cost more money. So it's to try and emphasize how important pollination is. Now, um, as a consequence of that, there's been lots of funding in research and a lot of articles, some of these are scientific articles, some of these are from the popular press, highlight the decline of bees. Some of them are focused on honeybees, some of them are focused on wild bees, but all focused on all addressing the problem of a decline of an ongoing decline of bees. So, what is the state, at least in terms of honeybees? And I'll say very briefly. Here is a figure showing the decline of honey. This is honeybee colonies, millions of honeybee colonies across time up to 2007 in the USA. And what you'll see is an ongoing decline. This is when so-called varroa mites were introduced into the USA. And this is when CCD hit. And I think this, this column is probably about 2 million. We we'll probably continue along about the same level. So actually, there isn't a 2006, 2007 sudden decline in honeybee numbers. There seems to be a big overwinter loss then, but there's been a general decline over the last few years. And this is a figure that I've taken out of a uh, Potsital article showing changes in numbers of honeybees in Europe. And we've got the Czech Republic. I'm not sure whether that relates to the Czech Republic there, that arrow. But it seems like the numbers of colonies have decreased in Northern Europe and they've increased in Southern Europe, it seems. Numbers of beekeepers have decreased generally in Northern Europe. Uh, but the figure I like most, and that's because I've been, I'm a co-author of the article, is this one that shows the changes in the number of honeybee colonies, so we're just addressing this one species, the honeybee, in Europe, in the European Union, uh, from 1960 up till, if not present, then nearby. And you'll notice a dramatic change in one figure, these open symbols, Wump at this point here. Uh, and this is because of this you'll uh, understand what the association is with. Varroa came into Europe about this period here. It was widespread in Europe. But the big decline in honeybee numbers has mainly been in former Warsaw Pact countries. And it's 1989, 1990, 1991. I don't think I need to tell you what happened then. Um, you know better than I do. Many of you have lived through it. Um, but it was a change in society a change in the social and political structures, more a change in social structures, led to this big change in the number of colonies. So actually, the point I'm trying to make here is, with honeybee colonies, at least in terms of numbers of colonies that exist year on year, the major factor that determines those numbers is the number of beekeepers, which is determined by society. It's not to do with biology. It's to do with society. Encourage beekeepers, and you've got more honeybees. Don't encourage beekeepers, and you've got less honeybees. So that seems to be the major driver of changes in honeybee colony numbers. Okay. We'll come back to honeybees later, and in relation to honeybees and pathogens, because just because there's a lot of colonies, and they maintain themselves, doesn't mean to say they're all very healthy. And certainly there are some problems that I'll address. How about wild bees? They don't have somebody looking after them to help them. I used to be based in Belfast and was involved uh, in work on biodiversity of bees in Ireland. Uh, and we looked in particular at the bumblebees, which are good historical records, to try and document changes in abundance. Here's one common species, Bombus terrestris. Pre-1980, but post but probably Post-1980, very widespread. It's a species which is very common here as well. Another species very common here as well, I'm sure, uh, and common in Ireland as well, in historical records, museum records, and also in more recent records as well that we pers partly have personally collected but have trawled from museum specimens and such like. So we've got 
In the case of those two common bumblebee species, no, no visible, no apparent change. Some other bumblebee species, though, have changed. Bombus cigarum, I think, is a species from the Czech Republic and probably quite rare here as well. I measure widespread, okay. In, Ireland, in Britain and Ireland, it's, it used to be formally widespread and is now very much restricted to the west coast. And here another species, I'm sure this is rare here, Bombus distinguendus, but we still have it in Ireland, but it's mainly restricted to the west coast, whereas formerly it was widespread. So if we undertake a formal analysis of those data, plotting for 50 kilometers square, the numbers of species pre-1980 and post-1980, and then uh, accounting for um, observer effort, then what we find quite markedly is a decline on the east coast of Ireland, in the eastern half of Ireland, not on the western half. No change on the western half, but a change on the eastern half. And I don't know whether any of you have been to Ireland. Has anyone been to Ireland? Anyone visited the country? Where did you go in Ireland? Did you go west coast or east coast? East coast is quite intensively managed, and it has agriculture as there is around here, uh, around Prague, and as in Germany or the Netherlands. The west coast is still very wild, very much wild and underdeveloped. So probably the driver of the decrease on the east coast is because of intensive agriculture, probably. And that's probably the case for most wild bee species, intensification of agriculture. And I'm going to take out just a little bit of data. Uh, so, uh, site seven, this is work, this is Brian Danforth and colleagues' work from the east coast of the USA, looking at changes in distributions of bees on the east coast of the USA. So it's a paper that came out earlier this year. And what we see is, from the years, I can't read this either, from the years 1872 through to 2011, we see the same pattern, basically, um, of decreasing numbers of wild, of, of wild bees, decreasing numbers of non-bumblebee wild bees, of bumblebees, and an increase in the number of exotics um, across time. So there's significant changes here, at least in the bumblebees, of a dr loss of species, and probably it's associated with agricultural intensification. Probably. So that's one thing. So we've got declining bee numbers. I think there's reasonably good data suggesting, indeed, even if honeybee colonies mainly responding to human societal changes, wild bee species that are important pollinators have decreased over the years. Why have they decreased? Well, you know, there have been multiple suggestions. And post-2006, 2007, this image came out. You might have seen it before. It's, it's freely available on the internet, suggesting a whole multitude of reasons. I think it's mainly focused around honeybees uh, and their mites and such like. But pesticides and intensive land use all suggested to have been causing bee decline. So. We've got, in this case, we've got the honey bee but in the middle, but we could be any bee. We've got multiple causes of bee decline. And I'm going to focus in this lecture on just two. One is genetics and the other diseases. Okay. And it's suggested, actually, that many of them interact together. First, I'm going to talk about genetics and genetic diversity because that's something that I'm interested in and something that I've been working upon. The idea is maybe reduced genetic diversity impacts upon the health, whatever we mean by health, of populations of wild bees. Maybe. So, are bees losing genetic diversity? And there'll be no prize for guessing this species, Jacob's going to say. Anybody else can have a go. Afterwards. What do we mean by genetic diversity, and how does it relate to health? Well, there's a very simple relationship. Genetic diversity can be measured in a variety of ways. The, mo the easiest way, using genetic markers, heterozygosity. And there's a very simple, theoretically, under the infinite, uh, infinite alleles model, there's a very simple relationship between heterozygosity and effective population size. The larger the effective population size, the higher the heterozygosity, and vice versa, for a, a, a given mutation rate. So there's a fairly simple relationship. And it's easy, probably easier to see it in, in this term, 
Uh, this is I've taken from uh, a review, an annual review of entomology, ecology, evolution, systematics. If we plot effective population size against heterozygosity and look at just, just the single locus mark of this dotted line, we can see heterozygosity is high when population size is high, decreases with decreasing population size. So that's okay, there's not linear, but it's a monotonic relationship between effective population size and uh, heterozygosity. Now, let's come to the issue of bees and their genetic health. Bees are haplodiploid. All hymenoptera seem to be haplodiploid. That is, females are diploid, males are haploid. Female lays eggs, unfertilized eggs develop into haploid males. Eggs that are fertilized by a male develop into diploid females. They are haplodiploid. And that means that for an equivalent population size of males and females, the haplodiploid species, like bees, have a smaller nucleotide diversity, a smaller heterozygosity, than diplodiploid in, in, yeah, individuals. So haplodiploids then have only 75% of the genetic diversity of diploids, other things being equal. So there's one issue that may impact bees and other haplodiploid insects. They may suffer from low genetic diversity because of, small, because of haplodiploidy. The other thing about bees, at least 10% of bees, including bumblebees and honeybees, is that they're eusocial. And that may also impact on genetic diversity. Something like 3% of bee species are um, eusocial, highly eusocial. There's plenty of um, ants and some, wa and, or ants and some wasp species that are also eusocial. Other hymenoptera are haplodiploid but solitary. And for eusociality then, Eusociality means one individual in a colony reproducing, others not. And that will reduce the effective population size. Because although a colony may comprise, for example, 40,000 worker honeybees, there is only one diploid queen who's mated maybe with 20 haploid males. So the genetic diversity in a colony is going to be less than would be in a solitary population of 40,000 individuals, whether haplodiploid or diploid. So we've got two phenomena, haplodiploidy and sociality, that may both impact uh, on genetic diversity. And I've been interested in seeing whether that's the case, I and mean, it's difficult to do it experimentally. The easiest way is to use a comparative approach or to look across species. And I think we heard on Tuesday about Katerina's thesis in which she employed microsatellites. And what I've done with colleague Tomas Murray is to scour the, data, scour the literature for data on microsatellites with which to compare genetic diversity of haplodiploids and diploids, diplodiploids, solitary and social. What are microsatellites? Here we can see a DNA sequence read from, I don't know what it is, but we can see at some point there's a repeat motif here of two bases repeat. So there's a dinucleotide repeat motif here, which will be a, microsat uh, that would be a, a, a microsatellite. And we've gone through the literature looking at insects, primarily um, um, the um, holometabolous insects plus termites, uh, hemimetabolous, but that are eusocial, and extracted from the literature data on a 290 species, uh, and that many loci, almost 2,000 loci, and looked at the variation that we see in microsatellite diversity. Now, there's heterozygosity plotted on the left again, expected heterozygosity, okay. and on the uh, x-axis we have what is termed the cloned number of repeats. That is, when somebody has developed microsatellites for a species, Andrina Varga, we have taken the sequence or the number of repeat motifs in the microsatellite that they cloned to develop that microsatellite locus. So that's our measure of, um, so that's our standard measure, if you like, of the microsatellite, and that's the heterozygosity. So 
One of those spots is one microsatellite locus. So we've got variation there across species, and you'll see uh, in this case I've coded the different um, insect orders with different colours, and also within the Hymenoptera given them different colours as well, so four groupings. And you see what a terrible dirty pattern. Oh, there's a relationship there, there's a monotonic relationship. Markers that are short, few repeat motifs, are, have low heterozygosity. Repeat motifs have high velocity, but it's a, a horrible relationship. So, for any statistical analysis, it's much better to linearize that relationship if possible. And what we have done is to uh, square root transform the heterozygosity, log the re cloned repeat length, and then we get a relationship uh, like this rather than taking the as in linear regression, uh, the residuals, we've rather used reduced major, action, reduced major axis regression. Have I got that on? Sorry, we've got, rather we've taken reduced major axis regression because both heterozygosity and this measure of the microsatellite repeat length are measures that are taken with error. So what we've done is to linearize the data and then look at the residuals we themselves were not normally distributed. So we looked at the residuals uh, on this reduced major axis regression. So we can throw all and every species on, make a common major axis, uh, reduced major axis regression line, uh, and then look at residuals around that. Very complicated. The data looks something like that. Again, it's, it's a right mess. There's a lot of data points there. But looking at the residuals of that regression, what we find within the Hymenoptera, which we've grouped into the Symphyta, which are leaf plant feeders, solitary, haplodiploid, parasitica, which tend to be parasitic wasps, tend to be parasitoids, the non-eusocial acculeator, which is the wild bees, solitary bees, and Vina Varga type, uh, and also solitary wasps, and the eusocial, the residuals come out like this, and they are then the differences between them, and there are significant differences between them. So the eusocial are indeed lower, have lower residuals, that means they are low di genetic diversity in comparison to the solitary species, as we might predict. Although it's very difficult theoretically to say how much lower they ought to be, it depends on the colony size. The symphyta are like the solitary bees. They've actually got quite high genetic diversity. The parasitica themselves, these parasitoid wasps that often undertake a lot of in inbreeding, also seem to have extremely low genetic diversity, like the eusocial acculeator. So that's within the Hymenoptera. Indeed, the eusocial species are very low. Let's now look across insect orders, what do we find? And here again, we've got the RMA, reduced major axis, residuals here. High means high genetic diversity, low means low genetic diversity, plotted. And what we find, again, the eusocial acculeates, so the social species, bees, wasps, and ants, the social bees, the social wasps, and ants, all have much lower genetic diversity than the, all the other groups, the parasitica as well. Whereas the symphyta and the um, non-social acculeator are rather similar, not in, this, in this analysis, not statistically different from the other species, Sl slightly lower, it's a little bit lower. Maybe we don't have enough power to, to, to find that they're lower. So what we can do with that showing there's a reduced heterozygosity, we can then go back and say, OK, reduced heterozygosity, how does that translate into effective population size, NE? And this image we've generated, um, which shows an estimate of the effective population size. I think the absolute numbers are not important. For diplo-diploid species, here, and for the haplodiploid hymenoptera here. And what we see is, first of all, 
haplodiploid, solitary haplodiploids show a slightly reduced effective population size from, solit from solitary diplodiploids, as one might predict. It's about 10% or so, which is what one would predict from that formula based on a drop of 25%. Uh, effective population size because of haplodiploidy. So that fits rather well. The worrying thing is that the eusocial species are way down here and they've got a drop in effective population size of 50% again or predicted in terms of genetic diversity. So, and that we couldn't have told from theory. Um, but it's maybe nice that the data seem to fit. The, hap the solitary data, the haplodiploids, fit very well with expectations compared with diplodiploids and the eusocial very much lower. So in this case, you know, what do those genetic data say? Well, they say, hmm, at least for the solitary species that have been looked at so far, for which there are data available, it seems as though their genetic diversity doesn't seem to vary so much from other species of diplodiploids, at least it's a little bit lower, be probably because of haplodiploidy, but not otherwise, not lower than would be expected. For the eusocial species, like the honeybee, the genetic diversity is much lower than one might, than just simply because of haplodiploidy. Right, so that was a, a comparative approach across a lot of species. I'm going to say a few more words about um, genetics, though, because bees, like other haplodiploids, have a special problem through lack of genetic diversity. There doesn't seem to be any lack of genetic diversity for solitary species, but for the eusocial, there does seem to be. For both, though, they have a special problem that arises through inbreeding, that of so-called diploid males. So this goes beyond any problems that loss of genetic diversity may, may, may be associated with, for example, through lack of adaptability or ability to change, last, uh, um, lack of um, um, standing genetic variation. And the problem is, is this. How is sex determined in bees? Well, probably in all bees, it's like it is in honeybee and one or two bumblebees. Female is diploid, male is haploid. Female lays haploid eggs, develop into males. She lays diploid eggs, she lays eggs, sorry, which are fertilized, they develop into females. Fine. Uh, and this system is called complementary sex determination. In the honeybee, it's been well characterized. It's based upon a single locus, so-called sex locus, or sex determiner uh, locus. Complementary sex determiner locus. So I'll just call it the sex locus. All well and good. What happens when female mates with a male, and in this case the male has the same sex allele at the sex locus? Could be through inbreeding, or could simply be because of low genetic diversity in the population. There is a low number, there are a low number of sex alleles in the population. In this case, when the female fertilizes eggs in this mating, some of the eggs are homozygous at the sex locus and they develop into diploid males. These ones, heterozygous at the sex locus, develop into females. And those diploid males are usually either inviable or sterile or some way have low fitness. So, there's a special problem that all species have that have this form of complementary sex determination, that of diploid males. And the diploid males then arise through low allelic diversity at the sex locus. The most obvious way is if brothers through brother sister mating, but it can just simply be because of small population size, low allelic diversity. And from uh, Amro Zayed, you know, taking this from Amro Zayed, there's a nice relationship here. As the effective population size decreases, the diploid male production, the number of dip, uh, the proportion of diploid males that are produced rises quite considerably. So diploid males are a sign of inbreeding in the population genetic sense of low genetic diversity. And Zayed and Packer have gone on to suggest that haplodiploids, like bees, may suffer from a so-called diploid male extinction vortex. If there's a decrease in population size, there may be a decrease in 
CSD, complementary sex determiner locus. Allelic diversity means increasing diploid male production. They're inviable. Leads to decreasing growth rates, decreasing population size, and this vicious circle then leading to a populations of Hymenoptera with complementary sex determination going into a diploid male extinction vertex, vortex. That was proposed back in 2005. And I think it was proposed partly based upon data that they had collected on so-called orchid bees. So I'm going to have to move you away now from Europe. Orchid bees are these, it's a lovely neotropical tribe of bees with very long tongues, the males of which are attracted to orchids and pollinate orchids and a variety of other plant species. Here are some of the examples here. They're quite large, often metallic, brightly coloured things. And the nice thing is, one can collect males very easily by using chemical baits such as vanillin or citral because the males will be attracted to them and you can collect and analyze them. Now, some analyses, including analyses by Amro Zayed and colleagues, have been undertaken on males. Genetic analyses of, and these are lots of orchid bee males here, using allozymes. And those studies have suggested that diploid males in orchid bees may be up to 100% in some species. This is an early study by Rubik. Um, another one suggested not so, uh, but then Zayad et al. This is a classic paper suggested that up to 56% of males in orchid bees were, diploi were deployed. Um, and a more recent paper um, also. So, you, know, you think, oh, goodness me, if there are that many diploid males, it suggests there are many populations of haplodiploids, in this case these are generally solitary insects, that are, must be in or entering this extinction vortex. So, even if our comparative study suggested no problem, maybe there are some special problems associated with this um, locus. How do we detect diploid males? The easiest way is to um, genotype males at very variable loci. If a male is, if an individual is heterozygous, it's diploid. If it's homozygous, it's haploid. And I won't worry about the form so. I'll just say, we use microsatellites, very variable, so we can tell, regardless of what the individual is at the sex locus, we can tell whether it's haploid or diploid. So, microsatellites that we've developed, I'll thank two PhD students, Rogerio and Marion, who developed microsatellites for two different sets of um, orchid bees. And we've then, um, with high heterozygosities, so the probability of detecting a, heterozyg uh, a diploid individual as heterozygous is very high. Uh, and we sampled across, or he principally, this is um, Rosario, has sampled across South America just under a thousand males from 26 species using not allozymes but microsatellites to look for diploid males. And what he finds is, in this is these are all the species here, and this is the numbers of males that he's analysed. In blue, haploids. In red, diploids. You can hardly see any red. They're all haploid males. And this is another set of species, part of that data set. So, you know, he found in of that just under a thousand males, five of them were diploid in contrast to what was found with allozymes. So actually, on mainland South America, dip orchid bees have very low diploid male production, suggests they've got high allelic diversity at the sex locus. They're doing quite well, thank you very much. So there doesn't seem to be a problem, at least not on mainland. Now, you might wonder what I've been doing yesterday in the hotel room. Yesterday I was stuck in a hotel room writing, trying to put together the, the, the tail end of a manuscript. And this is, the work, this is what I was dealing with. Uh, another student, um, Samuel Boff, also from Brazil, has been looking at this species, uh, Euglossa cordata, on islands. And I thought was, well, if mainland doesn't show signals of reduced genetic diversity in the orchid bees, Maybe we haven't looked hard enough. So maybe these former allozyme studies, and the people who wrote them were very critical of our work. And said, why are you really sure? So we thought, OK, let's work. Let's look at some island populations, which we know are very, uh, which must be isolated. And um, Samuel has worked in the southeast of Brazil. That's Brazil there. 
right in the southeast of, uh, sorry, the east of Brazil, uh, in Sao Paulo State, and this is the coastline here, with islands at distance from the coastline. This island is 38 kilometers from the, the coastline, and it's 11 kilometers from this side. And this species, Euglossa cordata, is quite common on the mainland. Um, it's found on these islands, and he has sampled a f over a thousand males from these four locations, these three islands and the mainland. And there's a nice pattern of so-called genetic isolation by distance. He's genotyped to all the males. He gets a nice pattern of isolation by distance. Okay. C clearly acts as a barrier, reduces gene flow or inferred gene flow, that we can say. But the important thing is, what about diploid males and what about genetic diversity? Well, when we look at genetic diversity on these locations, we find that the mainland and the large island, which is only two kilometers away, have more or less the same high genetic diversity. Genetic diversity drops on this island, and genetic diversity is lowest on the far island. So here we really have an isolated population. Okay, it's 11 kilometers from uh, the, nearest, uh, the nearest adjacent island. And the genetic diversity is much lower on the distant island than on the mainland, or than on closer islands. Aha, you think. So that must be a population that's entering the extinction vortex, diploid male extinction vortex. Well, actually, only one of about 80 males here was diploid. And a couple were diploid here, and a couple were diploid here. So the frequency of diploid males was 0.6%, like it was on mainland, more or less. And it had showed no relationship to isolation. So, despite the fact that on a distant island, gene, where gene flow is reduced, or effective gene flow is reduced, uh, at least the inferred gene flow from the um, um, FST estimates is reduced, despite that, they're still not producing any more diploid males. So they're not entering the diploid male extinction vortex. And that's probably because alleles at the sex locus are under balancing selection. A rare sex allele that enters a population, for example, enters here, of a male with a rare sex allele, a new sex allele enters this population. His sex allele is always at an advantage because it's, whenever, it may, whenever he mates with a female, it's always going to be in a heterozygous, the offspring will always be heterozygous. So this balancing selection of the sex locus may mean that actually populations of hymenoptera with complementary sex determination rarely do enter the diploid male extinction vortex. Probably other factors impact them before that. Okay, that's genetics, and now I'm going to switch track and look at pathogens and their impact upon bees. So here's our range of factors, including mobile phones. I saw the sign here, no mobile phones in here. It must be a safe place for bees. Great. So we've got, again, all these factors. And this time, I'm going to look at pathogens. And I'm going to take just a couple of pathogens in particular. So, and I'm going to focus to start with on the honeybee. There are a range of organisms um, that attack honeybees uh, and attack the hives as well. One of them quite widespread, is this microsporidium, Nosema apis. Uh, it's a unicellular, highly derived fungus. It's found in the ventriculus of the honeybee, um, where it attacks the epithelial cells. It is then defecated out, and other individuals are infected by ingesting the spores. Very well known. It's been around since, well, for a long time, probably for a few million years. But it was first described in 1907 by this gentleman somewhere near Berlin. So, well recognized. There is now a second species of microsporidia, Nosema, same genus, different species, that's now found in the honeybee. And our hypothesis, or my hypothesis has been, because this is a novel pathogen, maybe it's accounting for greater numbers of colony losses that people are finding, even if beekeepers can make up those losses. 
I'm going to have to take you to China, somewhere in Beijing, and not Mao Zedong, but rather a colleague of mine, Ingemar from um, Uppsala, who was visiting there in the early 90s, 1994, not to work on Microsporidia, but he loves Microsporidia. And he found inside the local honeybees, there's Nozema apis, that's what the spores look like. He found something which to me looks identical, but he could identify it as something different. Under the electron microscope, it looks a little bit different. Sequencing shows it's clearly a different species. There's Nozema serrani, here's Nozema apis, so in a phylogeny. I should take that's a phylogeny, you've been correcting me, I'm not sure. Um, it's clearly separate, uh, that we're clearly dealing with the a separate species. And so the first discovery, the first description of this Nozema serrani was in Beijing, 1994, by Ingemar Fries. In 2005, so over 10 years later, that species was reported in the western honeybee, Apis mellifera, in Taiwan. It was then reported in summer 2005 in Spain, in European honeybees, and again in Vietnam we found it in western honeybees that had been imported to Vietnam uh, and that sent to us with some strange Nozema disease. So, it's very easy to differentiate between the two species using molecular markers. We've developed an RFLP protocol based upon ribosomal RNA. We've got very clear differences between Nozema apis and Nozema serrani. Uh, this is an RFLP pattern. And we've used that to analyze material that was sent to me from colleagues around the world, both current material and also material honeybees that they'd had in their freezers for the last 20 years. And what we found, what we found was that pre-2003, all the sequences that we generated for a, a, from honeybee material, dead honeybee material that had been frozen, was of Nozema apis, the thing in blue. And anything in the literature that was published was always Nozema apis. Post-2003, all the material, not all, but most of the material was of Nozema serrani. So the, the material that we sequenced from Brazil, from um, Caribbean and North America was all Nozema serrani. And it's since been reported more or less worldwide. So this is a pathogen, Nozema serrani, very like Nozema apis and microsporidian, but it's distributed very quickly around the world. So that's one pathogen that I've been interested in because it might be causal in bee decline. The second thing I've been interested in are viruses, and the viruses in particular that are transmitted by this, the varroa mite on a honeybee. Varroa, is a varroa mites are restricted to honeybees. They are not native to Europe, have been introduced probably in the, late, probably in the 60s, but certainly in the 70s, and are now probably found in every honeybee colony. So again, it's an exotic, it's not a native, it's an exotic, in this case, mite. And the mite feeds by piercing the host honeybee and taking its hemolymph. In doing so, it transmits viruses. And there's a range of viruses it transmits. And here is DW, deformed wing virus, chronic bee paralysis virus, Kashmir bee virus, Israeli acute paralysis virus. And there's a whole range of viruses that this thing is trans that, 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 the vi that the varroa is transmitting and that cause honeybees to keel over and die, or it's thought to. Well, a little bit of data here. We've sampled honeybee colonies in, in the United Kingdom from mainland Scotland here, and Northern Ireland, not the mainland, but anyway, a large landmass, where the honeybees have varroa. And we've looked for viruses in, the, in the hon those honeybees. And we find lots of deformed wing virus, and a little bit of black queen cell virus, but a lot of deformed wing virus, which is a consistent pattern that others have found. On the Isle of Man, and this little island of Scotland called Colonsay, there are no varroa mites. Honeybees were taken there 50, 100, 200 years ago. The 
before varroa arrived, arrived, and nobody has imported honeybees or varroa mites onto those islands. So those are islands with honeybees without varroa mites. And there, when we look for viruses, and here we've um, got the percentage of colonies containing a particular virus, um, we find a little bit of de 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 deformed wing virus. The colors quantify how much virus is there. So red means we've got colonies with a lot of virus, orange with some, and green with just a little bit. So when there's no varroa, there's not very much virus in the honeybees. When there's varroa, there's a lot of particularly DWV. So we've got two pathogens which we're particularly interested in. And I've been working on those through a, a, an EU project by the name of BDOC and through a UK funded project, which is why I'm still associated with Belfast, with these other colleagues, in particular Mark Brown and Juliet Osborne, in a, um, addressing those two pathogens. And our idea is that these are two Im, um, exotic and potentially emergent pathogens. One is the viruses, deformed wing virus, which causes deform can de cause deformed wings, transmitted by varroa, and the other, the microsporidia. And here we've just got a cell culture in which we've been culturing uh, microsporidia. But the hypothesis then is that the microsporidia and the deformed wing virus, an exotic and a native which has become much commoner and much higher prevalence and much higher quantities in bees, the two of them, either individually or together, may be causing or may be causal in the overwintering losses and the losses of honeybees, maybe also of other bees. Okay. So I hope you understand the rationale of why I'm looking at those two pathogens rather than the range of other ones. These are two exotic or emergent, what we would call emergent pathogens, because it's recently risen in, a, in its uh, prevalence in, in honeybees. What have we done uh, to, to address this? Well, we, you know, what one does, not it? As a, uh, I'm an empiricist. We feed bees with Nosema serrani, or we inject them or feed them with deformed wing virus, either one or the other or both, and we do that in highly replicated uh, cage experiments, and we see what happens. So, the cage experiment runs something like this. You know, you take bees freshly emerged that are clean. You have a, a control. You have a control group and a. Um, a virus group and a nosema group and a nosema and virus group and you have lots of cages uh, <laughs> lots of bees so the lab in in summertime is full of these little cages with poor bees that have been either fed control or injected with virus or fed with nosema or both and then we look at least initially what we've just looked at is mortality so in this survival experiment I've got five replicates of uh, five replicates per treatment, 21 bees per cage, so five cages per treatment, and we've got treatment either deformed wing virus or not deformed wing virus, and nosema or not uh, nosema or not nosema. So we've got a control group which has got which is fed with the same solution as the nosema group that has no nosema as you as well, but doesn't is not injected with virus, just injected with the control solution. And we've got other bees that have either fed, that they're all treated identically, all are injected, all are fed, but um, some are and then are fed with nosema, and some are injected with deformed wing virus. And the red group, unfortunately, have both pathogens. And what we see here is a, uh, the survivorship here across days for these bees in the colony. And as you expect, as one would expect, the control bees live longest, about 40 days. The nosema bees don't, don't differ very much from the control bees, but the bees that have been fed, have been injected with DWV die very rapidly. And those that have been injected with DWV and fed nosema die most rapidly although it's not that much more rapid than with um, DW, than those that are fed with, uh, injected with DWV. So, we've, of these bees, we've um, checked post hoc, taken bees and checked to see what sort of pathogen loads they contain. And here we've got DWV 
the virus pathogen loads quantified using uh, real-time PCR. So this is a relative quantity of virus. And you see the ones that have been injected with DWV have lots of DWV. The ones that have been uh, not injected with DWV don't have any DWV. There's no difference between these two treatments, whether they've got no Z or not. So there's no interaction there between the pathogens. The same bees checked for nosema. The nosema treated bees have relatively high amounts of nosema in them, as you'd expect, we've given them. The control bees have no nosema, so that's nice, that's okay. But again, there's no difference between there, so there's no interaction between them. And if we look at the data again, overall, what I've done is extract from these survival data, we've extracted the so-called hazard ratio. Uh, so these are Cox proportional hazard models, for those of you that might be interested in survival analysis. Um, it's sort of like a form of non-parametric analysis. And what we can see is the, what, we, what we have, the hazard ratio, so the probability of death. So the higher up here, the higher the probability of death. And what we can see is, indeed, the ones that have got fed, injected with virus and fed the microsporidium have the highest probability of death, although it's not significantly different from those that have just been given uh, DWV. So clearly there's a, a relationship there, you know, that, that DWV seems to, actually, in terms of the hazard ratio, DWV is having the most pronounced effect. The microsporidium has some effect, indeed, microsporidium and virus together have a greater effect, but the most profound effect that we get is with the virus on survival. So. The impression actually is that nosema actually isn't doing very much and the virus is really killing and it's not interact but it's not interacting or at least not more than additively with uh, the microsporidium. So that's where we've got with these data and uh, what uh, Dino has gone on to do, the postdoc Dino um, with, me, with two colleagues from uh, Penn State, he's now looking at the transcriptome response of those bees that have been in the four different treatments using microarrays. And the nice thing about honeybees is that it, you know, it's like a model species, it's like a model system. There are microarrays containing the 12,000 genes of the, the honeybee genome. And uh, what we find, actually this is preliminary, uh, he's, he's analyzing that data at the moment. This is a horrible, I hate all this data, it's so horribly complicated. But what, 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 one, sh what one sees here are these 10,000 genes of the honeybee and uh, yellow Yellow uh, is down-regulated and blue is up-regulated and those that were fed, um, injected with DWV, either with nosema or without nosema, tend to cluster close together. And those control bees, or the ones fed just nosema without any DWV, also tend to cluster together in terms of their gene expression. So that's, just, that's ongoing work there, they're still analysing the data, but it's just to give you a little impression. Oh, actually, so in terms of the transcriptome response of the bee, it doesn't change much when it has nosema, but when it has DWV, it changes quite considerably. Now, I'll push the virus honeybee work a little bit further. We've also been working down in southwest Germany, in, near the Kaiserstuhl, again with honeybees, uh, and in this case, looking at overwinter loss, not of the colony, but of the bees. And the experiment is set up, has been set up by colleagues, in which we have 28 colonies that enter winter. And of those 28 colonies, we extract worker honeybees from them. There's no brood in the colony. It's at the end of the brood rearing season, so it's adult bees. Then, spring, February, March, the same 28 colonies, we take bees again. Of course, the colonies have got smaller. Many bees have died in between. But we're taking the same colony, workers from the same colony, before any more brood rearing. So we can compare what the, what the bees were like in autumn, the same bees in spring, or at least, if not the same bees, at least the same colony. And again, we've been screening for, in particular, DWV and nosema. And actually, what we find quite profoundly is that, and this is a bit of a complicated uh, mix of um, figures here, but what we find is the bees of the colonies going into winter, they have, most of them have got DWV in them when they go into winter, but when they get the same colonies in spring with the same bees, they've hardly got any DWV in them. Where has DWV gone? 
vehicle is not evaporated. <laughs> if we look at individual worker bees in black, this is here con uh, containing DWV. This is containing this is quantity of DWV in individual worker bees. In autumn time, when we collect the bees in autumn, some of them have up to 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 particles of DWV in them. Some have not very many. When we collect the bees in spring, they only have, we only find bees with very low quantities of DWV. I.e., all the bees that had a lot of DWV in autumn have died. They haven't made it to spring. And if we look at the prevalence of DWV in those worker bees in autumn across the 28 colonies. Some were heavily infected, some were lightly infected with DWV. In terms of prevalence of worker bees against the percent over winter loss, how much the colony declined. Some colonies lost 70% of their workers, some only lost 10%. There's a really good relationship there between VDV prevalence and loss of workers. In other words, the colonies that were heavily infected with VDV, they lost their or DWV, VDV, and this is a second virus now, I'm talking about VDV, very closely related to DWV, it's probably a variant of it. Those colonies that had a lot of VDV lost their workers. Not all of them, but most of them. Certainly all the ones that had VDV in them, or the, the virus in them. The colonies with little virus lost few bees. Uh, and just for comparative purposes, this is uh, another virus, black queen cell virus. And we see, yeah, there's a change between autumn and, and spring. We don't really see very much difference in the, in the loads. And there's no relationship here with overwinter worker loss. And we've looked at this for a variety of other viruses. And the one that's really strongly tied with this decrease is DWV or VDV. Actually, VDV, Varroa destructor virus, and DWV, deformed wing virus, two viruses that are extremely closely related. Uh, there's about 84% nucleotide similarity. And in these German bees, one last set of our primers just amplifies is, um, is our generic primer and amplifies up the, that virus, that mix of viruses. So we thought we were dealing with DWV. We have subsequently sequenced the thing and realized, oh, Actually, there isn't any DWV in these bees. It's all VDV. How strange. So what Dino and um, colleagues at, um, in Harrow have done, so a couple of postdocs, uh, Dino and Vincent, a couple of postdocs working with me have done, is to then compare, and they said, oh, so DWV is such a problem, but we only find VDV very similar to it. I wonder what happens. I wonder how, I wonder how the two compare in terms of their virulence. So they've replicated the same experiment that I said told you beforehand with control colonies. In this case, they've either got control colonies, which are in black, or controlled bees, which they individual bees that they've individually injected in black control, or they've injected them with DWV, or with VDV, or with a mix of the two. In which case, they've used 50% of VDV and 50% of DWV. And lo and behold, we're quite staggered about this. We only just, I think it's, it's only just in spring we realized what was going on, what might be going on. The control bees obviously live longest. The DWV bees die quickly, as I've shown before. Those with VDV die even quicker. And the mix, even quicker still. So there's something going on there. It's been suggested, actually, in this case, it might be, our suggestion is there might be recombination between these two viruses which are so similar that some virologists might just call them the same species. But it's a bit like flu virus, I might draw an analogy there, where we get H1, uh, H1N1 virus, which is a, a composite, um, a recombinant flu uh, that um, uh, caused the scare about four or five years ago, which is much more virulent. And we find within our, and here we've got the hazard ratio again, the mix of the two viruses is much more virulent than either VDV, which itself is more virulent than DWV. So again, hazard ratio, you can hopefully uh, understand this, a higher mortality of the mix. And uh, just a little bit at, at the end in terms of uh, its distribution, we've looked now at um, honeybees, 10 honeybees per location sampled across the UK, uh, Great Britain uh, for these two pathogens. And what we find, and these are uh, nice colour maps showing the distribution of DWV and VDV across the UK, the prevalence of it. 
So the darker the colour, the, the, the more prevalent the disease is. And this is the two that are together uh, when both VDV and DWV are, prevalent, uh, are present together. So actually we've got data suggesting that this VDV, which is very close to DWV, two viruses, VDV only first described in 2004, a new virus, probably a new variant of DWV, seems to be now quite widespread and is particularly virulent in honeybees. I'll say a final couple of words then about those viruses and Nosema serrani, which was our original interest, Nosema serrani, the Muxbridian, and the virus, in other bees. And here I'm going to um, thank Mark and Matthias, two colleagues from Royal Holloway, University of London, that have been working on this uh, UK uh, bee project. They sampled across the UK honeybees, which is the honeybees I've described already, and bumblebees from the same location. So they collected 30 honeybees per location, and the locations are these. They tried to make some sort of grid pattern across the UK. It got a bit thin up in the north, but they tried to randomize a, 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 a stratified random sampling of these, um, I think it's 20. I know there's 28 numbers, but I think it's 26 different locations. And from each location, they collected 30 honeybees, 30 bumblebees of the most common bumblebee species, and 30 bumblebees of the second most common species. The idea is to see whether pathogens in the honeybees are also in the bumblebees, or vice versa. And we've focused on DWV, but actually when I write DWV, I mean DWV and VDV, those two viruses that are very similar. And what we find is across the country, well, there's something of a pattern. Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't think that's so useful to look at. More useful is to look at the data in this way. They've only analyzed 10 of those 30 bees of honeybees and 10 of the most common bumblebee and 10 of the second most common bumblebee. But in the top panel, what we see is the prevalence of the virus. And here are the sites which will correspond to these numbers. And you'll see, oh, there's quite a lot of DWV in the, honeybee, in the honeybees. Sometimes, in some locations not, some locations quite a lot. To our surprise, the most common bumblebee also contained DWV. And the second most common bumblebee also contained DWV. Oh, well, it's not the first time it's been reported because there's a, I think, publication back in 2005 showing that bumblebees in the wild, in one location in Germany, did have DWV. But here we've got evidence that there's quite a lot of DWV in bumblebees. In terms of Nosema serrani prevalence, the microsporidian, yes, it's found in honeybees across those locations, but it's also found in bumblebees. <coughs> And Matthias uh, first has gone on to run experiments to show that DWV, when he feeds it to bumblebees, is pathogenic for bumblebees. It's multiplying in the bumblebees. Now, if we look at the distribution of Nosema serrani across Britain, in terms of its prevalence here now, in honeybee, its prevalence looks like that. This is a heat map here. In bumblebees, its prevalence looks like that. So actually, there doesn't seem to be any relationship there. So, okay, it's in bumblebees, and okay, it's in honeybees, but the two don't seem to be related. What we found surprising and quite staggering is that in honeybees, DWV, VDV, this virus complex, has this distribution. In bumblebees, it's a surprisingly similar distribution. Uh, and this is the distribution of so-called replicating virus, where we know it's actively replicating inside the bumblebees. And there is a strong statistical correlation, not, for, not, not correlation now, but it's strong statistical association between the distribution in honeybee and the distribution in bombus for this virus, suggesting they may be sharing pathogens. We've gone on further and sequenced variants of DWV and VDV in honeybees and in bumblebees from several locations where it's common to both. And what we find is this, and I hope the colors have worked out. In red are the sequences of the virus from bumblebees, and in black are the sequences of the virus from the honeybee. 
And what we see is in some locations, like in the green location, the honeybee, the honeybees and the bumblebees share the same sequence variant of the virus. In another location, the honeybees and the bumblebees share the same sequence variant. So that, I think, is pretty good evidence that there is sharing of pathogens. We have the advantage with DWV that it's an RNA virus, it mutates quick, it's a high mutation rate, so there are lots of genetic variants. So it's possible to partition the variants in genetic diversity within and between locations and within and between lo species. When we saw this a few months ago, we thought, why? That's quite staggering to think there may be ongoing transfer of the viruses. Of course, we can't tell in which direction the transfer is going, we can't say that, but it's my fear is, you know, that people will, will pick up the, uh, these, uh, uh, this, the data and make some suggestions like they have with, um, and, and sort of run in a, uh, an exotic uh, fashion and uh, trying to popularize this potential that either beekeepers will say, the bumblebees are killing our honeybees, we've got to kill all bumblebees, or the conservationists will say, the honeybees are killing all our bumblebees, we're going to kill all the honeybees. You know. In Britain, we've got a big problem with bovine tuberculosis. And it's carried by cattle. It's also carried by badgers. And I'm not sure whether you've been aware um, of the um, political and social tension that it has caused, because the government in the UK has at one point said, we will not kill badgers, and more recently they have said, we will kill all badgers, because of this problem of badgers that carry exactly the same strain of tuberculosis as the cattle carry. So there's a, a, a real problem there. Okay, so in summary, genetics, what role does it play in bee decline? Currently it's unclear whether it's causal. I think it's, I'd, I'd leave that as unclear. Parasites, I think it's necessary for understanding bee decline, certainly of honeybees, maybe of other bees. And importantly, when we think about diseases in bees or insects visiting flowers, we should realize we're actually dealing with a multi-parasite, multi-host system and not think, I'm working on the honeybee, I'm working on the bumblebee. Clearly, these things, pathogens, are uh, multi-host in, me in many cases. Right, I have to think, I have to thank the funders, which are EU and UK government and some German um, uh, government money. I have to thank some of the team, and I've got the names are listed here, Tom, Jessica, Mersini, Maureen, Antonella, Dino and Vincent, some of whose work I've um, presented here. And I have to thank other people outside of Halle and Sam, whose photograph I didn't get, um, for also contributing some of that work. And I thank you for your attention.